All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? Matthew here. We're going to continue our countdown of the top 100 books today. Now, this is going to be the third installment in the series, so you're definitely going to want to go back and check out my two other videos, 100 to 75 and then 75 down to 50, because today what we're gonna do is 50 down to 25. Now, I just wanna remind you that if you go to my main YouTube page, you can click on a thing where it drops down more links, and you can actually see a whole spreadsheet where I have all of these with links to my own reviews of these books, as well as links to Amazon if you wanna buy any of them, okay? So, that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Now, we left off here with number 51. This was The Outsiders. I did warn some parents here that this book, although I thought it was a great coming-of-age story for teenagers, it does have some mature themes in it, so you're going to want to use a little bit of discretion before you just hand it over to your teenager. But I think it's a really, really charming story of the tensions uh, that we all experience in youth as we're trying to grow up and figure out who we are. Okay, number 50, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, one of the all-time classic novels. You're definitely going to want to have to slog through this one at least once in your life. And I say slog through it because some people find it very hard reading. Herman Melville in this book, he tries to write in every genre that he can. So he uses all kinds of literary styles. But it is a great work. R.C. Sproul loved this, by the way. If you're ever in R.C. Sproul's office, he had a huge picture of the whale, which is why I have my little Moby Dick whale here in my office. It's kind of an homage. Either way, a great story. Definitely going to want to read that one. Number 49, Francis Turretin and the Institutes of Elenctic Theology. This is a three-volume work, one of the greatest systematics of all time if you're reformed. It does, as I mentioned, comes in three volumes, and Francis Turretin is considered one of the peaks of the Calvinistic high orthodoxy area of history. Uh, definitely want to consult him on most important matters related to systematics, so check that one out. Oh, and by the way, let me just go back real quick. Whoever sent me this for free, thank you so much. I love you lots. Somebody out there in the interweb sent me the three volumes as a gift. So thank you very much for that. Here's B.B. Warfield's Collected Works. Now, I wish these were accessible online like the Edwards works are. You can get all of Edwards' works on the edwards.yale.edu site. Wish all these were just as easily accessible. Maybe they are somewhere out there, but I've got the hardback editions right over my shoulder right here, and man, do I appreciate him. He was one of the Princetonian theologians, and he's got all kinds of stuff. He's got Reformed theology, he's got history, he's got stuff on Calvin and Westminster, some exegetical things. Interesting, interesting works, and I'm very thankful for B.B. Warfield. Next, we've got Lord of the Flies by William Golding. This is a story about what would happen if a bunch of kids got trapped on an island. And if you don't know how it ends up, it's not good. Uh, if you think children have pure, innocent little spirits about them, and uh, it's the big people that are all the bad people in civilization, uh, this book will disabuse you of that false notion. Children definitely have a sinful nature, and this fictional story of a bunch of British boys getting trapped on an island together <laughs> illustrates it very well. Here's Jonathan Edwards' Freedom of the Will. Now, it's not my favorite book of Edwards. I've said that many times. There's a lot of things I like better than Edwards, but this one is pretty important, and it is volume one in the collected works. Edwards here talks about what would eventually become known as compatibilism, the idea that the sovereignty of God is not in irreconcilable tension with human will. Edwards works that out very, very biblically, although people who read it think it's a little bit circuitous and he makes the same arguments over and over again, so it is a bit of a snoozer to try to read through it. Very important, though, and some people think it's never been refuted. All right, number 45, Francis Schaeffer, A Christian Manifesto. I just posted a video just the other day in which I covered chapter 7 and 8, Francis Schaeffer on Christian resistance to tyranny. So you might want to check out that video. It's a long video, 50-minute lecture on Christians and civil government or the church and the state. So watch that video. And hey, if you like what I talked about in that lecture, maybe you'll like this book, A Christian Manifesto by Schaeffer. Next, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Preachers and Preaching. If you are a pastor, you have to read this book. It's one of the classics on the great art and science of homiletics, delivering the word of God with conviction and authority. Number 43, lectures to my students. You know, don't forget that Spurgeon, he was not only the prince of preachers, one of the great ones, but he was also a founder of several institutions, including institutions to train pastors. And here is his lectures to his students. They're very, very helpful about ministry, pastoral life, uh, maintaining your own walk with the Lord, preaching, outreach, evangelism, all kinds of things like that lectures to my students. 42, John Frame, A History of Western Philosophy and Theology. 
I really benefited from this book. It's a big book. It's a reference book, and Frame takes you through all of the main philosophical ideas of the Western world, essentially, and he critiques each one of them from a biblical, Reformed, and Christian perspective. So if you want to know about the Enlightenment, for instance, or existentialism, or any kind of big concepts, Frame is going to critique them from a Christian perspective. Very helpful work. 41, Mere Christianity. Do you love it? C.S. Lewis, one of the smoothest, most charming writers there is. Everything Lewis writes is just brilliant. Does he get mere Christianity right, though? Um, in some sense, yeah, he really does do a pretty good job of reducing Christianity to its essence. But from a reform perspective, we snobby, um, <laughs> we snobby Presbyterian theologians might say that he got a couple of things just off in this book. Read it and tell me what you think. Number 40, Animal Far Farm by George Orwell. Now, you may remember Orwell from 1984, which is his classic dystopia. This is another great dystopia, much easier to read. Even young people can read this book. It's only about 100 pages or so, and I think you're going to see that he he really uh, he he kicks down some uh, some authoritarianism pretty strong here. I really love this book. 39 Along the same lines of lines of dystopia, we've got Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. This is a futuristic dystopia in which books have been banned. In fact, they're all supposed to be burned. Fahrenheit 451 is the temperature at which paper burns, by the way, if you get the reference. But the protagonist, he discovers the truth and the beauty and the wisdom of books, and he seeks to preserve them in some way. The plot is fast-moving and adventuresome. You're definitely going to love this book, I promise. 38, How Then Should We Live by Francis Schaeffer. Well, we just mentioned a Schaeffer book a moment ago. How Then Should We Live is his critique of Western culture. He sees it in decline, like the Roman Empire fell because of their decadence. So also he thinks that Western culture today is declining. What should we do about it is the title question of the book. 37, Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas. Whatever you think about Eric Metaxas as a radio personality, I don't think you can really dispute that he was a pretty good biographer, as evidenced by this one on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who worked to uh, essentially to a conspiracy against Hitler in his time in World War II. He is martyred at the end of the book, Bonhoeffer is, and I cried when it happened. Even though I knew it was going to happen, it was late, it was 2 in the morning, and I got to the end and I cried. So tell me if you cry when you read the end. 36, Consequences of Ideas. Here's another one on philosophy by Sproul this time. Kind of similar to what Frame does, only Frame is much longer and much more detailed. Sproul, in his normal, alluring and charming way, he seems to capture the ethos of some of these major ideas so simply and yet so sublimely. Miss Sproul so much. He was such a talent and such a gift to the church, wasn't he? 35, The Holiness of God. If you're going to read anything by Sproul, please read this one. This is kind of his most famous book and one of his seminal works. 34, Systematic Theology by Louis Burkhoff. If you're looking for a reform systematic, there's only one volume. This is probably the one. Now, you could get Turretin, who's three volumes, a little bit smaller font, a lot more to comb through there. But Burkhoff is a great distillation of the reform tradition. He very much is working off the shoulders of Bavink. And so if you've read the five volumes of Bavink, or if you like those, Burkhoff is kind of just a, a simpler distillation of that. But he's often one-stop shopping for me if I'm looking for anything on a particular topic. Like just yesterday on the Lord's Supper, I was going to preach on that last night. And so I just hit up Burkhoff just to make sure I've got all my boxes checked. He's great for that. Easy, readable, lovable, excellent. Okay, I've got two Edwards biographies for you in a row. We could flip the position here. It depends on my mood. But George Marsden wrote A Life... Um, on Jonathan Edwards. It's an excellent biography. In fact, as far as academic biographies go, it's probably the best one out there. He gets all the details right. And I, I well, let's most of them, I'm sure. There's probably a mistake in there somewhere. Uh, but whenever I want to check the order of his life, his biography, his chronology, I often go to this book to make sure I've got my I's dotted and my T's crossed as far as Edwards's actual life. Now, Flipping one more to the Murray biography, these two, man, which one do you like better? I don't know. They're both great. This one, I will tell you, is more devotional. So if you're wanting some of the great nuggets of Edwards's uh, spirituality, probably this one 
was written with a little bit more of a devotional perspective, also a very accurate biography. Uh, they're just two different styles of writing. One is a little bit more of a pure biography, whereas this is more of a spiritual biography of Edwards, okay? 31, Plato's Complete Works. Now, if you're going to read some of the great philosophers, of course there's Aristotle, but I think you're going to like Plato better, to be completely honest, because what Plato gives you is what's called the dialogues. These are stories about the life of Socrates. So every one of his works is, is actually a story. And Plato writes about Socrates. Let the reader understand how that works. Socrates was his mentor. And in every single one of the dialogues, Socrates is walking or he shows up at a party or something like that. And he begins to have a conversation with his interlocutors about the meaning of a particular concept like wisdom or truth or courage, okay? And each time Socrates refutes the faulty ideas of that person's definition and he takes you down into a deep exploration of what that concept could mean. And often Socrates throws up his hands and says, how should I know? What do I know? I'm just asking the questions here. But I find all of these stories to be to be really, really delightful and often very elucidating. OK, 30 now. OK, so this is a collection of Kurt Vonnegut's works. Welcome to the monkey house. I don't know if this is the best one out there. The only reason I put this particular work up here is because I love Harrison Bergeron, which is a short story that you can read in about 20 minutes. I read it every year to my kids just to warn them about some of the dangers of tyranny and governmental overreach. So. This book is worth it just because it has Harrison Bergeron in it. Harrison Bergeron, short story, makes it all the way up to number 30 on my top 100 list. 29, what is Reformed Theology? Now, I just said earlier that <sighs> The Holiness of God is Sproul's most well-known work and probably his most beloved. Fair enough. But I have gone back to What is Reformed Theology more often, helpfully, than The Holiness of God. And that's this is why, because... When I was coming into Presbyterianism from G generic evangelicalism, what does Reformed theology really helped me solidify some of the main concepts, such as covenant theology, such as tulip, such as some of the sola doctrines. So if you're looking for a really good introduction to how Reformed people think, historically and otherwise, this is the one right here. Love this book. I still use it from time to time. 28, The Hobbit. Okay, fight me in the comments. I think The Hobbit's better than The Lord of the Rings, okay? I love the movies, The Lord of the Rings, but the books just don't do it for me. But The Hobbit is the one. This is the one. I love this one. It's a great read. You should read it with your kids. It's a great uh, conquering the dragon archetypal story. How can you do better than The Hobbit? Number 27, Holiness by J.C. Ryle. Uh, now, can you always trust the theology of an Anglican uh, not always, because, look, they're all over the map, right? You've got your evangelical Anglicans and your Catholic Anglicans and your Reformed Anglicans. This guy from yesteryear, he's one of the trustworthy ones. I think everything he writes is very, very helpful. And holiness, its nature, hindrances, difficulties, and roots, contains a bunch of chapters on the theme of holiness, which you could just read independently as essays if you want to. You're going to benefit from it, though, I promise you. Number 26, John Piper, Don't Waste Your Life. That's right. Don't waste it. It's short. It's brief. It's beautiful. God is glorious. And this book just gets straight at it. This book hit me like a dagger in the heart right when I needed it. I still think about some of those lessons that Piper preached and taught in Don't Waste Your Life about how quick life goes by and how you really have to soak it up for all of its joys and seek to glorify God with every breath you have. Finally, 25, The Diary of David Brainerd. Now, this is actually in the Edwards corpus because Edwards was the editor of David Brainerd's journals. It's volume seven in Edwards's collected works, but you can also get this one as a paperback in various abbreviated forms if you want to. David Brainerd was a missionary to the Native Americans, and this is his firsthand account of all of his soul struggles of going through the wilderness in the cold, all alone, exposed to the elements, and trying to reach some of the indigenous people for the sake of the gospel. He does finally find success after much of his struggle. And then unfortunately, Brainerd dies at a very young age from tuberculosis. He was a colleague of Jonathan Edwards, which is why Edwards edited his volumes or his journals. And this book ended up being the spark that really lit the um, 18th century missionary movement on fire. So God use this book in a tremendous way. And I think you're going to benefit from it, even if you read just snippets of it at a, at a time. All right. Next time we get together, we are going to hit 
the top 25. That's right, next time we do one of these videos, it'll be 25 down to one. Don't forget again, you can get my spreadsheet with all of the links if you go to my YouTube page and just hit those drop down links, it'll be there. Thanks for checking in, I do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.